Rock's Classic Rock, Q1043. Good morning. I have with me this morning Bob Spitz. He is the author of Led Zeppelin, the biography, which is out now and happens to be the perfect Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, or even if it's not holiday gift for the Led Zeppelin fan on your list, or, you know, just a fan of rock and roll because it's it's a rock and roll history lesson um, that, that Bob has engaged in. First of all, why did you decide to do this book? And did you have the blessing of the guys in Led Zeppelin? Uh, well, I'll tell you how I decided to do the book. It, my, it was my editor's idea for me to write a book about a band who has sold more albums than anybody but the Beatles. And he made me guess. And so I knew it wasn't the Stones or the Who and Elvis, no. And then I thought, oh, God, he wants me to write about ABBA. And I thought, <laughs> I can't do that. And he said, no, it's Led Zeppelin. And I went, Led Zeppelin, I have 20,000 vinyl albums in my collection. I don't have a single Led Zeppelin album. Um, I was on the road with Bruce Springsteen and Elton John during those years. And, you know, our, our paths just didn't cross. So I, I was, it was, I was the right person to write this book because I was an empty vessel and I let them just fill me up. I really learned about this band from the ground up, spent five years uh, talking to everybody. And to answer your question, um, I don't write books with the blessing of anybody. Um, I write books with cooperation. Now, I was supposed to have cooperation from this band, but as we started writing the book, Me Too hit. And all of a sudden, this band wasn't talking to anybody. Um, so uh, unfortunately, I had to rely on, on uh, extensive, extensive interviews they had done before. But I, th I think I was able to recreate their entire career and, and put you, the reader, right in, in the scene as they were making their music and, and living their lives. Have you heard from anyone in Led Zepp their reaction to this? Uh, not yet, but I hear I'm about to get an earful because they just got their books yesterday. Oh, so man. Uh, we will see. Yeah, but I've heard from uh, everybody who was involved with them, their, you know, their road people and their um, uh, their colleagues at the record companies. And uh, I, I'm getting really wonderful feedback. So I'm, I'm, I feel like I've done my job. So as a non Led Zeppelin fan. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, we have a countdown here um, at Q104.3. We have our listeners vote their 10 favorite rock songs and then we play them from the, you know, from from 104, right. from, from 1043 down to number one. Can you guess what is number one for 20 years and this year, no doubt, will be the 21st year. Can you well, I'm, I'm hoping it was Stairway to Heaven. It most certainly is Stairway and this, to Heaven. And we are now, you know, the, on yesterday was the 50th anniversary of Stairway to Heaven. That's so, right. That's right. Yeah. So what surprised me in your book about Stairway to Heaven, two things that um, Robert Plant was still writing it while they were recording in session. <laughs> right which is just unbelievable. And John Paul Jones didn't know what the song was about. So right. they well, still don't, don't, I do not know what the song is about. And the I most don't think... classic song, perhaps, or certainly one of the most classic in rock history. Yeah, I don't think Robert knows what it's about either. I mean, you know, look, um, Robert wrote lyrics the same way that Jimmy wrote songs. And that is, they weren't songs. They were all pieces of things. They were riffs that were embroidered together. And Robert had all this imagery in his head. None of it made any sense. None of it connected. And yet he found a way to make it poetic and to make it you know, to create a mood with the words, the same way that Bob Dylan did with a lot, you know, people ask Dylan, what does this mean? What does that mean? Dylan said, some of the times, I don't know what it meant myself. The words just went together and it poured out of Robert, you know, first, I mean, he wrote that first line and he looked at it and he went, huh? 
stairway to heaven. He didn't even know what he had. And then, you know, other images came and he, like I said, he knitted them together. And 50 years later, we're talking about, we're still talking about this song. And do you know what Robert Plant calls Stairway to Heaven? I don't know what. He calls it that damn wedding song. Oh, I know that. You're absolutely <laughs> right. You know what my wife calls it? My what? wife calls it the song you agree never to play again in our house. <laughs> there hey, you have, have it. you, Bob Spitz, who wrote Led Zeppelin, the biography, which you can buy now. He's the author of The Beatles as well. Are you a Led Zeppelin fan now? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Died in the will. Wool. I mean, you know, here, here I was, uh, somebody who had 20,000 albums. I was a musician myself, worked with Bruce Springsteen and Elton John, didn't know Led Zeppelin. It's like, you know, somebody sitting down and saying, have you tried this sonnet? If you like the sonnet, Shakespeare wrote a couple plays too. <laughs> I mean, it was great. I became a huge Led Zeppelin fan and came to really admire what these guys put together for their lives. Okay, so what surprised you most in all the research you did on Led Zeppelin and all the people who came into their paths over the years? Mm -hmm. It was basically how they, how they were able to play what they played in concert. I, as a musician, I know that, you know, you play an arrangement you work on every night. These guys didn't do that. They riffed. They went out on tangents, and yet they were like jazz cats. They knew what each guy was doing, even when they were just, you know, experimenting with sound. They, they, they managed to stay together. They let everybody do what they did, and then just, bang, it came together at the end. Shocked me. as, as It just shocked me completely. So their first concert ever together... Yep. They played at a place where Spirit was playing. And of course, Spirit became, you know, they sued over Stairway to Heaven. They did. And lost. And yet I heard the similarity. And of course, so many of the things that, I mean, Jimmy Page admit, it, it, at least in your book, the, it, from the people you talk to, admits that they liberally, you know, took from other people and, and made the, the, the music their own. What yeah. is your view of the spirit stairway to heaven? Lawsuit? You know, I, I think everybody borrows, you mm -hmm. know, you, you, influences are, are hard to categorize. You, you borrow something, something has an influence on you. It appears in your music. Novelists do it. Uh, biographers do it. Believe me. Um, the problem with Led Zeppelin is they put their name on it. <laughs> you know, in the, in the case of Whole Lot of Love, it was a Willie Dixon song. All of a sudden, it becomes a Jimmy Page and Robert Plant song. I mean, y y they got into trouble for that and they paid the price. But I, th I think with Stairway to Heaven, uh, I, I listen carefully to it. Um, it's, it's not like George Harrison lifting, you know, uh, my his, his i never music. heard that my sweet lord i never oh i heard. did oh did, did you well you're I a musician did. and i'm not yeah but but with with stairway to what heaven was that he's so fine my sweet yes lord? he's so yeah. fine in my never to me it's it. this it's note for note wow but with with uh stairway to heaven i i think they took things here and there but um i don't i don't think you can call it plagiarism okay one of the things that surprised me and i don't know if most people know this, that the person who named Led Zeppelin was a member of the who? Keith, Keith Moon. Moon. Right. Exactly Tell us that right. story. That's fascinating. Well, the, these guys had all gotten together to record with Jeff Beck on his Truth album, and which I think is one of the great albums of all time. And the, um, you know, it, it was just fantastic. They, uh, they, they put this fantastic sound together and it turned out to be something that they wanted to, to perpetrate and, and to perpetuate and so Keith Moon said we, we can't form a band like this it would go down like a Led Zeppelin and Jimmy stored that away so there you have it so Bob Jim to me to me and I was on New York radio with Led Zeppelin in the late 70s. And to me, Led Zeppelin was the first huge heavy metal group. 
at least in my mind then, that's what I considered them. And now I learned from your book that Jimmy Page hated being even linked with heavy metal. You know, he did, but uh, too bad, Jimmy. I mean, you, you uh, created it, you bought it, pal. No, look, you know, Jimmy had a sound in his head that no one had ever heard before. I mean, you know, we heard, a, we got a taste of it with Jeff Beck's Truth album, which Jimmy played on with John Paul. But uh, by the time Led Zeppelin emerged in, in late 68 and early 69, uh, it was a sound that came right out of Jimmy's head and became progressive and, and heavy metal. So, uh, you know, I, I think he, he's got to wear that badge a little. Now, we mentioned much earlier the Me Too movement and Led Zeppelin. I mean, there were nightmare stories that we heard about them, but the worst was the fish. Aha, uh -huh. the mud shark, you mean. Yeah. Very so famous explain. story. Yeah. yeah, well, it's hard to explain. I mean, look, you know. There Things some... were done to a woman with this fish. Yes, and, and books before mine tried to blame it on this young groupie. I mean, it's really hard to, uh, to, to take something out of context like that. This was a poor, unfortunate woman who was looking for any kind of, you know, attention she could get. And four men who were in their late, you know, mid to late 20s took advantage of her. You know, it's an awful story. I hated putting it in the book, but I couldn't avoid it because you know, uh, Frank Zappa wrote a song about it and it's been reported before. So I tried to, to put it into its proper perspective and let you know exactly how this came about and why. You know, it's so interesting. Certain people can do certain things and be canceled. And then there are others who aren't canceled. Right. And it was a different world then. Yeah, well, rock and roll's gotten a real pass on, you know. We all know what goes on on the road. Look, I was I was on the road for eight years in the in the seventies. You know, it, it it's going to come a court, and it, they're going to have to pay the piper at a certain point, and uh, uh, it, they're they're going to have to start behaving a little and respecting women a little more on the road. Let me ask you this, uh, you know, after doing this in-depth book, this this Led Zeppelin, the biography, yeah. is there any chance in your mind of even a one-off reunion again? Because Robert Plant is just so heavily entrenched in no, 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 and now back with Alison Krauss. Yeah, it'll never happen. And, huh. you know, John Paul and Jimmy have tried to jumpstart it a few times. But I just talked to somebody who had lunch with Robert, and he no longer can get the words Jimmy Page out of his mouth. He why? always talk, he talks about my collaborator, my bandmate, but he but will why? not say the word. Uh, I think that what happened to Robert at the end of Led Zeppelin with his son dying, he and his wife in a terrible car accident, all the drugs that divided the band, and the death of his mate from the Midlands, John Bonham. I think they all piled up on this guy who was incredibly sensitive. And he, as he came into his manhood, decided no more, this is it. I'm not having anything to do with it. Plus, I think he just sang that damn song one too many times. That damn wedding song, but they did right. unite once. They did. They they did. They did out of respect to Ahmed Erdogan, who uh, mm. they they really loved. But uh, I think Ahmed could have brought them together, but not a dollar more. Is there anything else you want to add? We have like 30 seconds left. You know, I, I'm hoping that this is a great story that gives fans just, you know, an idea of what happened and how this wonderful band put out all this great music and, and gave us something that will live for the ages. Here we are 50 years later. That's right. And the music is still as fresh and even more popular, I would venture to say, uh, than it was when it was originally recorded. And coming up next, would you believe even the Salvation Army is hit by supply chain issues <laughs> and, and even hurting worse 
you know, they thought they would get through the pandemic fine. No supply chain issues. We'll be checking in with them next. Q104.3. New York's classic rock. Q104.3.